I use different designs, manufacturing processes and materials in an attempt to recreate a homemade version of an iconic band toy from my childhood. The year is 1988 and Australians are enjoying fun in the sun at the beach, grabbing a snag or two with mates and catching a ride on their local monorail. But six-year-old me has got bigger issues on his mind. Some of my favourite toys had already been banned from school. The yo-yo was great, but soon disappeared after it was weaponised. The metal inside slap bands was cutting kids' wrists up and giving them tetanus. Hand blasters were living up to their name and taking kids' fingers off. And even the seemingly innocent schoolyard classic, The Marble, was banned because kids were running a gambling racket. But there was one banned toy that hit me the hardest. I call it a pop ball. You turn it inside out and drop it. Now available at all good toy stores and news agents. Leg pop, pocket pop, head pop, double pop. As far as I was concerned, this was the best toy ever. The black coloured ones were banned first, which only added to the mystery and urban myths surrounding their disappearance from schools. Over 35 years later, and a lot of those myths have never been able to be confirmed or denied. That is, until I got in touch with the toys creator, Peter Fish. But where did pop balls originate anyway? Well, they've been around for a long time, all over the world, in different forms. Peter Fisher's point of difference was the safety air hole. You can still buy cheap pop ball variations. Unsurprisingly, they're pretty low quality and don't live up to my memories from the 80s, but they're still fun to play with. Let's try recreating our own pop ball in the workshop. I took some measurements, looked over the patents and read the scientific research before designing my own infusion. I started with some 90A Shore Hardness TPU filament that I already had. Now this stuff is stretchy, but it's on the higher end of the Shore A Hardness scale. I picked up a cheap durometer so that I could test Shore A Hardness as I go. The new pop balls measured somewhere about mid-scale, so I didn't hold much hope for the 90A TPU. But it was a logical place to start to see how things turned out. It printed fine, the supports removed kind of okay, but the filament was far too firm to recreate the pop ball's action. My first attempt was a failure. I also printed a sample so that I could measure the material more reliably. Coincidentally, I learned of a new resin product from Monocure 3D with short hardness and elongation traits that sounded about right. This stuff was a limited release and pretty pricey. When it arrived, I added it to my vat and started printing. And let me tell you, this resin has some nasty fumes. It maxed out the VOCs on my air quality station up the other end of the workshop, but my exhaust fan made it safer to come in and out of the workshop. I had never printed with flexible resin, so I had some failures and some things to learn. After some research, I found some settings that worked for me and I was able to print my first resin pop ball. I washed it, then removed any IPA with compressed air and cured it with UV. It felt like it was going to perform well, even though the sure hardness was a bit higher than I was expecting. Monocure 3D recommends a heat curing after UV post curing, so I did that inside my Bamboo Labs 3D printer. There was no notable change in the hardness of the pop ball, but what had changed was the smell. It now smelled like cherry. And while the pop ball did revert to its original shape, there was no pop. The resin wasn't elastic enough, but it did look like my design would work if I could find the right material. So next up, I thought I would try some DIY injection moulding using 3D printed moulds. I didn't include the hole in the pop ball because that was where I was going to inject the rubber. Peter Fish had also told me that the hole is not critical to the performance of the pop ball. I'm using polyurethane rubber that I'm familiar with from past projects. It's easy to work with, has a good pot time, cures in less than a day, and most importantly, makes very durable parts. I used a precision syringe to inject the rubber into the mould. The following day, I removed the flashing and then opened the mould. Things were looking good. 
but I soon found that my mould design wasn't great and I struggled to remove the pop ball. But I got it out eventually and I was happy with the finish. I also poured a sample for testing purposes. It turned out that the polyurethane rubber was softer than I expected and the end result was lacking that pop. I made some minor revisions to my mould design and printed some new ones. In my email exchange with Peter, he had revealed to me the real reason why the black coloured pop balls were banned initially. I wasn't sure that I had the tools to injection mould natural rubber, but I had an idea to add carbon black to the polyurethane rubber to increase its hardness and improve elasticity. This industrial carbon is commonly used to reinforce rubber tyres. I started by adding 10% carbon black weight by weight. If you're going to use this stuff, note that it is very messy and probably carcinogenic, so take care. I had made what looked like industrial Vegemite and I was a little concerned that it wouldn't set. A day later and it did set and came out fine. But the hardness was a little on the low side for what I was aiming for. Despite it looking terrible, it did actually pop. The hardness was lower than the plain polyurethane rubber that didn't pop, but its elasticity was improved by the addition of carbon black. Surprisingly, I was on the right track. So I tried again and mixed another batch of polyurethane rubber, but this time with less carbon black, down to 5% weight by weight. The industrial Vegemite was much smoother, which gave me hope that it would perform better. After removing it from the mould, I trimmed it to clean it up and then tested the hardness. It looked about right, but did it pop? It sure did, and it was a lot better than the previous version. It was at this point that Peter Fish was kind enough to mail me one of his last remaining pop balls. It looked like this was a promotional one, let's say from the 90s, based on the web address written on it. And boy was this thing just as I remember. The sheer power puts the newer versions to shame. It turned out that the sure hardness was about 10 units higher than the new pop balls, which makes sense. Peter shared some of his manufacturing secrets with me, which were fascinating. I took some measurements of the genuine pop ball and slightly revised my CAD design. And it was about this time I discovered a company named Recreus that specialises in flexible filaments. Their 60A TPU features nearly 1000% elongation, and it even comes with a disclaimer because it's so difficult to print with. But I'm up for a challenge. The filament arrived all the way from Spain, and I had high hopes. But Peter had doubts whether you could 3D print a pop ball at all. I started by thoroughly drying the filament as recommended by Recreus. My first print jammed the extruder gears, which wasn't a great start. In order to get a print to finish, I slowed the machine down to just 3mm a second, which meant print time for this small design was 24 hours, and with a high chance of failure. The printer was severely under extruding. This led to multiple failed prints, and left me scratching my head. But it turns out that some smart people had already solved the problem. There is actually a screw to adjust the extruder tension, but you can't unscrew it as it fouls on the extruder housing. So I made some modifications to the housing that would allow me to adjust the tension on the extruder on the fly. Then I shortened the Bowden tube to reduce resistance for the filament. And I rigged up a dodgy spool holder for a more direct filament path. And those changes, and many slicer tweaks, worked. There was still some under extrusion, but it looked like a pop ball. I wasn't entirely happy with the print quality, but after weeks and many failed prints, I was all out of ideas. After all that work, I just wanted to know one thing. Would it pop? The action felt promising. So I set it. And it performed really well.
It wasn't on par with the genuine pop ball, but it definitely matched the performance of the modern pop balls. I was content that I had recreated my favourite childhood toy and learned so much more about it in the process. Now there was only one final thing to do. It was time to return the genuine pop ball to its original creator. Thanks Peter. <laughs>